Welcome, congregation. Today is Easter Sunday. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Let me open by reading uh, just a few verses from Romans chapter 8. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. With rejoicing, we begin our worship with a time of prayer. Let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, we give thee praise and the glory, for thou art the God who saves. Thou art the God who has done wonders. The wonder of creation itself is a marvelous work that captivates us. The beauty of creation and the wonder of it all, Father. But we know that even creation itself was not as great a work as the work that thou didst perform in Jesus' death and resurrection. For in Jesus' resurrection, all things are made new. In Jesus' resurrection, we have a new creation. We have a new beginning. We have eternal life. We have salvation. We give thee thanks, Father, for this is all thy work. This is the day which thou hast made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it, Father. Even if we cannot be together in corporate worship, and even though the shelter at home ruling is, is still upon us, and we are kept from seeing each other and calling upon thy name together in the flesh, nevertheless, we still rejoice, and we thank thee for the means that thou hast given us to worship thee together in this particular way. We thank thee, Father, for this day, the first day of the week, the Sabbath day, where we can enter once again into the finished labors of Jesus Christ. We can be reminded once again that all our sins have been forgiven and we have peace with thee through Jesus Christ, thy Son. We can be reminded, Father, of the new life we have already been given that has been imparted unto us by Jesus Christ and through his Holy Spirit. And we pray, Father, that the new man in us and that new life in us might be refreshed and strengthened as we dwell on thy word together. And we thank thee, Father, that with this day, we can enter again into the hope of the resurrection of the body and we can uh, begin again a new week living in the hope of who we are in Jesus Christ and what Jesus has accomplished for us, what thou hast accomplished for us through his suffering and death and resurrection. We thank thee, Father, and we praise thee that thou art the God of peace. And thou art the God of power, and thou art the God of grace, and the God of justice. All thy works praise thee, O God. And we pray that through this meditation and through this message, our hearts and minds might be lifted up to see thy works and to praise thee for thy works. Father, we also confess our sins, our need for Jesus Christ. Father, of ourselves we have no strength, and shouldst thou depart from us for even a moment, we would 
fall into death and, and uh, fall into bondage and misery again. And even now, Father, there is that old man of sin within us. We thank thee that thou dost never completely take away thy grace from us, but thou dost uh, always bless us and uphold us. Father, we are sorry for our sinful natures. We are sorry for our slowness to believe and to trust in thee. We are sorry, Father, for our sins. We hate our sin, and we wish, Father, that we could put away our sins once and for all. So, Father, we pray, cause us to taste and see again what Christ accomplished, and that in Christ our sins are all forgiven, and there is a day coming when we will put off that old man of sin once and for all and enter into the perfect enjoyment of life eternal with thee. And we pray that that day may hasten, and that Jesus Christ might come quickly We pray, Father, dwell in us more and more, sanctify us by thy Holy Spirit, rule in our homes and our families more and more, that we might live more and more out of the resurrection life of Jesus Christ and show who we are as those who are partakers of a new and godly life. Bless us in our particular callings, whether it be as husbands or wives or parents or children, brothers or sisters, or single members or grandparents. We pray, Father, for thy grace. Help us to have the right attitude, especially in these circumstances where we perhaps are prone to grumble and complain. We perhaps feel lonely. We perhaps are anxious and worried about our health and safety or our work and the economy. And there are stresses, Lord. We know that stress is in many ways, but a, a word we use to cover up the fact that we're not trusting in thee as we ought. So drive us to the foot of the cross, drive us to see Jesus, and drive us to see the empty tomb and what it means, and to enjoy peace and rest, and to keep a quiet heart, and to wait upon thee and be of good courage, and, and wait for thee to strengthen our heart. Be near unto our congregation in all her particular needs. Be near unto the aged, especially. Keep them in thy tender care. Be near unto the little children and the busy homes and families. Be near unto uh, our office bearers, our elders and deacons and our pastor. Be near unto uh, also those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake even in our own congregation. Give us boldness, Father, to witness of our hope in Jesus Christ, that we might not be ashamed of the gospel. We know, Father, our persecution is but little compared to what others in thy church throughout the world are experiencing. Uphold and bless them, Father, on this Sabbath day. Give them to joy in the hope that is found in Jesus' resurrection, that there is no need to fear, no reason to fear, for our Savior has obtained eternal life for us. And indeed, he rules as king on his throne in the heavens. And all things are for thy people's sake. Bless us now as we hear a portion of thy word. Open the scriptures to us and strengthen us by it. That it might be a means of grace. And that thy name might be exalted above all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For our message this morning, we turn to John chapter 20. 
John chapter 20, which records the account of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and how the disciples and friends of Jesus experienced it. John chapter 20, I'll read the first 18 verses. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, who is John, who's writing this gospel, the gospel according to John, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulchre. And he, stooping down, and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulchre, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. But Mary stood without at the sepulchre, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulchre, and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things unto her. So far we read God's holy and infallible word. The text is the first ten verses of John chapter 20. Let's reread those verses. John chapter 20, 1 through 10. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulchre. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulchre, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. 
beloved congregation, our Lord Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. Do you know what that means? Jesus rose from the dead. The one who was born with the curse of our sins on his shoulders, the one who went to the cross of Calvary and shed his blood and endured the death that we deserved as punishment for our sins, he has risen from the dead. The one who cried out with amazement as he was suffering under the burning judgment of God and who died on the accursed tree has risen from the dead. Do you know what that means? What it means is that Jesus has made a complete payment for all our sins. Our sins can be and will be and have been forgiven. What it means is that the church with Jesus Christ as her head has victory over death and the grave. We have obtained in Jesus Christ an eternal life that cannot be touched by death. What it means is that we too who belong to Jesus Christ will enjoy the resurrection of our own bodies, which will be made like unto Jesus' own resurrected body. What it means is that the way to the Heavenly Father, the Creator Almighty, is forever open to us, His people in Christ. And what it means is that Jesus rules over all. He has the keys to hell and to the grave. And in Jesus Christ, you and I are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And what it means is that we don't need to be anxious for anything. What it means is that we have nothing in life to fear anymore. We have nothing to fear in life. We have nothing to fear in death. What it means is that there is salvation. There is good news for sinners. Beloved, that needs to be impressed upon us. Beloved, are you anxious in life right now? Are you discouraged or are you fearful about what you might have to go through in the days and the weeks ahead? Jesus, your Savior, has risen from the dead. And though we can't see him sitting on the throne in heaven, ruling over all things, he is. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. This is the center of all our hope and the center of all our joy, the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. Without Jesus' resurrection, there is no hope for anyone in all the world. But with Jesus' resurrection, there is hope, a certain hope for those who put their faith in Jesus Christ. And we know Jesus lives because God's holy and infallible word tells us Jesus rose from the dead. And we know Jesus lives because God, according to his decree of election, also has worked his Holy Spirit in us, who bears witness with our spirits that Jesus has risen from the dead. And we know he lives because we understand that the whole of our salvation, the sum and substance of the whole scriptures, rests on this reality that Jesus rose from the dead. And children, let me point something out for you. Children, do you know why we come to church for worship on Sundays? Do you know why Sunday is the day that we gather together for worship? The reason is this. The fact that Jesus' resurrection took place on Sunday. 
And Jesus' resurrection on Easter Sunday is the beginning of our new life as Christians. And really, we gather for worship every Sunday in order to celebrate again Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Every Sunday again, we come to enter again and to enter more deeply into the new and eternal life Jesus has obtained for us through his resurrection. And every Sunday, we begin the week reminded of the forgiveness of sins we have in Jesus, reminded of the new life we have in Jesus, and reminded of the blessed hope of the resurrection of the body and life everlasting that we have in Jesus' resurrection. And every Sunday, we worship God for what he has accomplished through Jesus' death and resurrection. And really, every day of our lives is a celebration of and an enjoyment of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, this morning, we want to consider this marvelous truth of Jesus' resurrection from the point of view of Peter and John, as it's recorded in John chapter 20. And it's striking because in John 20, we have the account of Jesus' resurrection from someone who wasn't even looking for it. In John 20, we have the account of Jesus' resurrection from someone who must have spent the last day and a half, last two days, going through unspeakable heartache, anxiety, and sorrow. The one thing that in the minds of the disciples should never ha have happened and that could never happen, did happen. Jesus died on the cross. And they were overwhelmed with grief and anxiety and misery. And suddenly, Easter Sunday comes and there is good news for everyone. Our Savior is alive. And in fact, all these things that took place in these last few days that seemed to cause such anxiety and heartache were actually working for the good of all God's people. We take as our theme, seeing the not quite empty tomb. Seeing the not quite empty tomb. And we look at that theme under three points. First, the astonishing sight. Second, the deepening understanding. And third, the inevitable joy. And we can begin by reviewing the events that took place Friday afternoon. In John chapter 19, we read that after Jesus cried out, it is finished, and after he gave up the ghost, Jesus' body was taken down from the cross and brought to the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And there Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus prepared Jesus' body for burial. They wrapped his body with linen cloth and with spices and placed him in a tomb that had never been used before. And now it is Sunday morning. And we read from the Gospel accounts that there were a few women who rose up early that morning before the sun had even risen, before the, the sun began to shine, to return to the tomb of Jesus to finish preparing Jesus' body for burial. And as the women approach the tomb of Jesus, they see that the stone to the opening of the sepulcher has been rolled away. And Mary Magdalene, coming to the conclusion that the, gate, the grave must have been ransacked and that someone must have stolen the body of Jesus, she decides that she needs to run back to Jerusalem and tell the disciples about what the women have seen. So while the other women continue to proceed to the sepulcher, and eventually they have their interaction with the angels at the sepulcher, Mary turns back to Jerusalem, which was not very far away, and goes and tells Peter and John what she has seen. And this is what we read in John 20, verse 2. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Now let's stop there and notice something for a moment. Let's notice that Mary 
and the other women that had been with her were not expecting to find evidence of Jesus' resurrection. In fact, that was, was the last thing they were expecting to find. Apparently, they, along with everyone else, hadn't given it much, hadn't given it much consideration, even though Jesus had told his disciples that he would rise again from the dead before all these events happened. What's striking is that even the Jewish leaders remembered what Jesus had said about his resurrection. That's why they asked Pilate if they could set up a watch at the sepulcher. But the disciples of Jesus, overcome probably with grief and sorrow, must have forgotten this instruction of Jesus and had given no, po had given no thought to the possibility of a resurrection. We should also ask, why were these women coming to the sepulcher of Jesus. It was to finish preparing Jesus' body for burial. They were not thinking about a resurrection from the dead. This itself is a clear witness, a proof, of the truthfulness of Jesus' resurrection. Now, how contrary this is to what many will say today. Many will say today that the disciples were simply a bunch of people who were sitting around wanting Jesus' resurrection, wanting to believe it, and so they made up this story. No, the Gospels tell us that this was something that needed to be shown the disciples before they even understood it or embraced it. Peter and John had to see the grave clothes. Mary Magdalene needed to meet Jesus face to face. And even doubting Thomas wouldn't believe until he saw the scars on Jesus' body. So all of this is a, a clear testimony that, that Jesus has risen from the dead. Well, as we keep reading in John chapter 20, we read in verse 3, Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. Peter and John, hearing from Mary that the sepulcher has been ransacked, decide that they need to investigate these matters for themselves. So the three of them head out once again to the sepulchre, Peter and John leave Mary behind as they run ahead. And John, probably because he's younger, is the first one who arrives at the sepulchre. But John doesn't enter the sepulchre. And then Peter comes behind John, and Peter runs, or he doesn't run, Peter proceeds to enter right into the sepulchre. We read in verse 4, So they both ran together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulchre. And we read in verse 5, And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. And then we read in verse 6, That when Peter finally caught up with John, Peter didn't hesitate. But as is perhaps typical of Peter, Peter enters right into the tomb to investigate. And then John follows Peter into the tomb. And what do Peter and John see? Well, they see that there's no body to be found in the tomb of Jesus. But they also notice that the tomb is not quite completely empty. First, they see the grave clothes that had been wrapped around Jesus' body. And the grave clothes were lying there in the exact place and position where Jesus' body had been laid. They were lying there as if still in the shape of Jesus' body. With the, with the linen cloths still connected together, still wrapped together. Second, they see the napkin that had been wrapped around Jesus' head, still wrapped, still in its shape, lying in a place all by itself, according to verse 7. And here it might be helpful to understand uh, the burial practices that were common in these days. In these days, most likely, bodies would have been prepared for burial like this. The bodies would have been wrapped in linen cloths in such a way as to leave the face and the neck and the, the top of the shoulders unwrapped, to, to leave them exposed. The face and neck would not have been covered up. However, the upper part of the head would have been covered up. It would have been wrapped by a cloth that had been twirled around almost like a turban. This was the napkin. This was the cloth 
that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. Now, what's the point of bringing our attention to see these clothes? Well, the point is twofold. First, the point is this. This is clear evidence that Jesus has risen from the dead. It's very obvious that Mary Magdalene's information, or at least her speculation, was incorrect. The body of Jesus had not been stolen from the grave by grave robbers. In fact, the body of Jesus hadn't been tampered with by anyone. After all, if Jesus' body had been stolen from the sepulchre, would the robbers really have bothered to strip all the, gra the, the grave clothes, the linen cloths, off of Jesus' body and set them, try to set them neatly in place again? No. Typically, if robbers had stolen the body, they would have simply grabbed the body with the grave clothes and, and taken it all away. So that's the first point. This is clear evidence that, that no one's been tampering with the body of Jesus. Jesus has risen from the dead. And then second, the point is this. This is clear evidence that Jesus' resurrection from the dead was a special kind of resurrection. This was no mere resuscitation. This was not Jesus being raised from the dead in the same way that, say, Lazarus was raised from the dead. Remember, children, when Lazarus was raised from the dead, what happened? Well, Jesus had to tell the people, loose him. Unwrap the grave clothes so that he can stand once again on his own two feet because he's trapped in his own grave clothes. Well, that kind of thing didn't happen here. Obviously not, because the grave clothes were still all wrapped together in the position in which Jesus had been laid in the grave. When Jesus rose from the dead, it was not as if Jesus had to try to awkwardly stand up and, and awkwardly try to take off the linen cloths as his arms were, were wrapped and, and try to free himself from the grave clothes. No, if that had been the case, then the grave clothes would have been heaped up in a big messy pile off to the side. And if that had been the case, then also the spices that had been uh, put into the grave clothes would now have been scattered throughout the rest of the tomb making a big mess. Don't you see? If Jesus' resurrection was like Lazarus' resurrection, and Jesus had to get himself out of his own grave clothes, that would have involved making a huge mess. But the point is, Peter and John don't see anything like that at all. When Peter and John enter the tomb and see the grave clothes, the only conclusion that they can come to is that something special and unique has happened. And all of this helps us also to understand what the resurrection of Jesus was. The resurrection of Jesus was special. It was more than just a bodily resurrection. It was also a transformation. Because what must have happened was that Jesus' body must have passed through the grave clothes. If we had been there at the moment when Jesus rose again from the dead, what would we have seen? Would we have seen Jesus stir, open his eyes, sit up, and begin to struggle out of the bandages? No. Because then Jesus would have been raised back to a natural body, not a spiritual body. He would have been raised to life only to have to die once again like Lazarus. No, if we had been present in the tomb, and if we could have seen Jesus at the moment of his resurrection we would have seen a wonderful change take place. The fact that there, there were no eyewitnesses to this particular moment perhaps tells us that no mere earthly eyes can witness such a, a holy thing take place. But if we can speculate, if we had been present at the tomb of Jesus the moment that he arose, we would have seen a wonderful change take place. The physical and natural body of Jesus would, in a sudden, in a, in a twinkling of an eye, have become a spiritual body. What was corruptible now suddenly has been changed into the incorruptible. And what was earthly suddenly has changed into the heavenly. And what was mortal has suddenly changed into what is immortal. And as Jesus' soul came out of heaven and rejoined with his earthly body... 
And as his earthly body was glorified, Jesus must have in that glorified body passed right through the grave clothes. This is also the significance of that napkin, that, that grave, those grave clothes that had covered Jesus' head being still wrapped together. Notice that. Uh, verse 7, the, the, the napkin, the grave clothes around the head were still wrapped together in a place by themselves, still having its circular shape. That's what Peter and John saw. Oh, it must have been as if Jesus' head passed straight through that napkin, and the, that cloth napkin fell to the ground and still kept its circular shape right there, a little apart from the rest of the grave clothes. And all of this is meant to teach us that Jesus' resurrection was more than a mere physical resurrection. It's a sign that Jesus has entered into the state of glory. When Jesus died, Jesus entered the grave on the side of death, on the side of corruption and dishonor. But when Jesus arose from the dead, he arose on the side of eternal life and incorruption and honor. Jesus went, as it were, through the grave. He didn't, he didn't come back on the same side, but he went through the grave, defeating death, defeating the grave, and he arose as the victor over death and the grave. Jesus' bodily resurrection was Jesus' entrance, as far as his body is concerned, into everlasting life. It was Jesus taking upon himself everlasting life. It was a resurrection into glory. It was Jesus in his body taking to himself not an earthly life, but the life of God. Having the life of God, having the Holy Spirit pervade and permeate and dwell in Jesus' entire human body. And at the same time, transforming Jesus' body so that that life of God and so that the Spirit of God can pervade the entire body through and through. This is what it means when the Bible says we will be raised with spiritual bodies. Same body, and yet transformed so that they are entirely permeated with the Holy Spirit. This is what Peter and John saw in the tomb. This is what the grave clothes were showing them. This is the importance of the grave clothes. This is what Peter and John saw in the tomb, and this is what Peter and John also came to understand. At least, this is what John tells us about himself. And as we read this passage, we need to remember that it's John himself who is writing this account of what he and Peter saw and what he understood at the grave of Je at the at the sepulchre of Jesus. It must have been an interesting moment when Peter and John entered the tomb of Jesus and saw the grave clothes. And they must have just stood there and paused and simply reflected on everything that they were seeing. And it's interesting that we don't hear about Peter and John talking to each other about what they were seeing. Maybe all they had to do was look at each other and they understood what they were thinking. But there's a little more that is revealed to us in the text than we might first notice about what happened in the sepulchre. Because, interestingly, in our text, John uses three different words for the word see, to see. Notice these words with me. First, notice verse 5. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet he went not in. The word saw in verse 5 is the word that simply means to look and to see. It's the ordinary word for seeing something. Then notice, second, the word in verse 6. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulchre and seeth the linen clothes lie and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. The word seeth, there in verse 6, 
is the word from which we get the word to theorize or theory. And the word means to wonder about the meaning of something. So it means that Peter, as he was looking at everything in the tomb, and as he was putting, t- he was trying to put the pieces together, and he was thinking about what everything meant. That's how Peter was looking at everything when he was in the tomb. He was examining it with his eyes, we could say. And then there's the third word, as we find the, for the word see, as we find it in verse eight. Notice verse eight. Then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. And the word saw there in verse 8 is actually the word that means to see with comprehension, to see with understanding. We could say to perceive. So the one word is to see, the other word is to examine, and now this word is really to perceive and to understand. What this means is that John entered the tomb, he saw everything as it was, and he understood what it meant. He understood what it meant, and he believed, and he embraced it. Looking at the clothes lying so neatly, so remarkably undisturbed where Jesus' body had rested, John reaches the only reasonable conclusion. Jesus' body must have been raised in glory so that it simply passed through the clothes, leaving the evidence for the resurrection behind. This is simply what John saw. He understood, and he believed. And maybe this was the difference between John and Peter. Peter looked at everything and and said, I just don't understand. What, What are we to make of all of this? It's clearly the case that the body wasn't stolen, but it doesn't appear like the normal resurrection either. And so so Peter is theorizing what happened. And John sees everything, and he understands this is no ordinary resurrection. This is the resurrection of the one who was the Messiah. And we read John understood, and he believed. Not that John had never believed anything before, and that now John was suddenly made a, a true Christian for the first time. No, but it means that John believed and understood the resurrection of Jesus for the first time. And now maybe we can ask the question, well, what did John really understand? And and what does it mean that John now believed? Well, here we need to notice the words of verse 9. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. There are a few things we can point out about verse 9. First, in verse 9, John is not actually commending himself for how quickly he believed the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, the opposite is the case. John is, in a way, rebuking himself. He is reproving himself and the other disciples for just how slow they were in believing. John is saying, look, I first had to see, and then when I saw, I believed. I didn't believe at first. I first had to see the grave clothes, and then I believed. Remember, it's John writing verse 9 himself. John is rebuking his own slowness to believe. In addition, what does John say? He says, up to this point, we didn't know the scriptures. His point there is this, the scriptures themselves, the Old Testament, plainly reveals that the Messiah should rise from the dead. And Jesus had taught his disciples that over and over again. He explained how the Old Testament scriptures spoke of these things. And yet, they didn't know it. They didn't understand it. It didn't make sense to them. Their faith wasn't that strong. But now, after seeing the grave clothes, it began to make sense sense to them. Here was clear evidence of something extraordinary, something that seemed to match up again with who Jesus was as the Messiah. And John says, 
God was using the evidence of the grave clothes to work this faith in me. I saw, I understood, and I believed. And ultimately, it was God. It wasn't me, but it was God revealing these things to me and giving me the strength to believe. And we should understand that even at this point, this is only the beginning of understanding. John still didn't understand everything clearly. John and Peter and the other disciples still will need Jesus' own personal appearance to them and, and Jesus' instruction to them in order to understand it more fully. And John probably didn't understand at this point why Jesus' resurrection was necessary or why it was the inevitable outcome of what Jesus did on Good Friday. At this time, the disciples of Jesus didn't understand his resurrection fully because they still weren't understanding Jesus' death on the cross fully. The fact was, until the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, John and Peter and the other disciples weren't even equipped to fully understand and appreciate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But nevertheless, John did understand, and John did believe. He saw, and he believed. And then what does Jesus say later on? Jesus will say, blessed are they who haven't seen, and yet do believe. Congregation, although we haven't seen the grave clothes, although we weren't there in the tomb on that Easter Sunday morning, Nevertheless, it's the same for us. By God's grace and by God's grace alone, we believe the resurrection of Jesus. And even with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, we understand now why all these things make sense and why these things had to take place. Jesus' resurrection was a necessity. As Peter preaches in Acts chapter 2, it was not possible that that. Jesus should be holden by death. Death could not keep him back from, from enjoying the fullness of life. Because on the cross, Jesus paid all our debts. He satisfied God's justice. He bore the curse of God entirely until it was entirely emptied upon Jesus. No more curse for his people. No more curse upon him. Even before he died, Jesus could say, It is finished. And he speaks of God as his father, as his friend. And therefore, though Jesus died, and though he needed to experience all the different aspects of death, nevertheless, it was not possible that Jesus should remain dead in the grave. He's defeated death through his own death on the cross. Sin was dealt with exactly as God demanded. And so death, which is the punishment for sin, could not retain its hold on Jesus. For Jesus was innocent. It was necessary, it was logical that Jesus should rise from the dead. And even if Jesus, even if John didn't understand this clearly, we today should. But even here we are reminded once again, it's only by God's grace that a person can believe the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not for lack of evidence that people don't believe. The evidence is there. You, you simply have to see it with open eyes, and, and it speaks. It witnesses of the truth. It's because there's a lack of faith that people don't believe. A person could even be in the position of Peter and John and see the grave clothes. A person could see the empty tomb and all the obvious evidence and yet, until God gives that person the faith to believe, and, and God works faith in that person, that person cannot and will not believe the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And even for us today, we still don't understand Jesus' resurrection and all its implications like we ought today. Because if we did, I think we would be characterized by more joy more peace, and more confidence and boldness in our Christian walk. Although the text itself doesn't get into these matters of the joy these disciples felt, that was the inevitable result of everything they had seen and come across. They believed, and they had great joy. And the more they began to understand, 
And the stronger their faith was, the more their joy increased. Well, the resurrection also gives us great joy. For all those unto whom God has given the faith to believe, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is really the wellspring of all our joy. Knowing the resurrection, as I said in the introduction, knowing the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we know we have the complete forgiveness of all our sins. We have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Jesus' resurrection is the proof that he is no longer under the curse of God that was due to us, and that God had no more reason to punish Jesus for our sin. Knowing the resurrection, we know that in Jesus Christ we have a new resurrection life. Through faith in Jesus Christ, we are made partakers of a life that has already passed through and conquered the grave. We live no longer under the bondage of sin, but we live unto Christ. We live a new and godly life. And knowing the resurrection, we know that one day our bodies will also be raised up to be made like unto Jesus' glorious body. Death is not the end. Not for God's people. Death is not the end of living for God's people. After death, there is everlasting life to enjoy with Jesus in glory. And knowing the resurrection... We know that we are more than conquerors. We have peace. We have rest. We have joy. Everything is working for our sakes. Exactly because Jesus arose. He has dominion and rule over all things. And he who died for you and me is working all things for our good. Congregation, your mediator, your head, your elder brother rose from the dead. Your Savior has conquered the grave. Even in difficult circumstances, even when the threat of death in all its forms surrounds you, take joy. This is Sunday. This is the day that we celebrate Jesus' resurrection. And this is the day that we celebrate the promise we have through Jesus' resurrection of everlasting life. And in a sense, every day is Sunday. Every day we get to enjoy living out the eternal Sabbath, the rest and the victory that Jesus has obtained for us through his resurrection. This is the day the Lord has made. And, and we can truly say that about every day as we live out of Jesus Christ and we live out of his resurrection life. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. May the Lord give you that joy day by day. Strengthen your faith. And may the Lord cause you to see the hope and the salvation that you have in your blessed Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father, give us to understand. Give us to perceive. Give us the knowledge and the confidence of faith, true faith that we might embrace Jesus Christ and the realities of his resurrection. And may these thoughts dominate our lives so that we live with joy, we live with peace, we live with confidence. Rule in us, Father. Cause us to taste and see the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the resurrection life of Jesus Christ more and more in our own lives. And may we use it to give thee the glory that is thy due for these marvelous works, unspeakable works that thou hast done. So bless this word to our hearts and our lives. Continue to take care of us, Father, day by day and this week. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen.